are still using now by Daniel Kepner at MIT. And I also wanted to acknowledge the, the very important role he has played in this physics, not only because he studied the physics of repaired states, but also because he made very important contribution in cavity QED. For instance, using these circular atoms, he observed the inhibition of spontaneous emission when, when atoms pass between very close space mirrors. So how do you describe this circular state? We have to remember, as I said at the beginning, that a particle is also a wave. So the electron which is going around has a wavelength. It's called the De Broglie wavelength. And the condition for the instability of the orbit is that you have an integral number of these De Broglie wavelengths on the circle. And this, this number is the principal quantum number of the Rydberg atom. And if Rydberg had known this, he would have understood the, the Rydberg formula. In fact, the Rydberg formula, which was understood by Niels Bohr in 1930, it's just an application of these this simple ideas. So you see that in this state, uh, the, 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 the wave dipole. is delocalized. And to get an electric dipole, what you do is that you admix with a pulse of classical microwave two uh, Rydberg states whose principal quantum number differs by one. You prepare from starting with E, this pulse of microwave, prepare a superposition of the energy. Here we encounter again this notion of superposition. The atom is at the same time with equal probability in state E and in state G. And this you could call, if you wish, a Schrodinger kitten. It's, a, it's like a Schrodinger cat, which is at the same time dead and alive, but it's a very small one because it's a single particle. And we'll come back to this a little bit later on. So we have, uh, you prepare this state, and when you prepare this state, what happens is that uh, the two waves, which are in this state and in that state, interfere constructively at one end of the orbit and destructively at the other end. And now you have a wave packet and you have a dipole and this wave packet rotates at 51 gigahertz, which is the Bohr frequency between the state C and G. And we like to think of this rotating wave packet as to be in the hand of a clock rotating at 51 gigahertz. So what we are want, to, want to build is an atomic clock which will be very sensitive to light. How sensitive to light? First of all, we have to detune slightly uh, this, uh, the, the atomic transition from the cavity field because we don't want photons to be absorbed or emitted. We don't want to lose photons. But when atoms are detuned from the field, there is still an effect on the atom. And then this brings me back to closed current energy. In his thesis in 1961, he had described this effect, which is sort of a light shift effect. Non resonant light shifts the energy level of the atom by a small amount. In our context, you see that the atom in level E will have its energy slightly increased and the atom in level G its energy slightly decreased. And this increase and decrease is proportional to the light intensity, that is to the photon number. And it will lead to a phase accumulation of the dipole as the atom crosses the cavity. And we can define a phase shift per photon final. And due to the very high sensitivity of this atom to microwave, this phase shift of photon can be as large as pi. 180 degree, which means that if there is zero photon in the cavity, the dipole will point in one direction after cavity exit, and if there is one photon, the dipole will point in the opposite direction. And if you are able to measure this phase shift, you will count the photons and here decide whether there is zero or one photon. So you have to count to measure a phase, and measuring phase is a field of interferometry. So we have to build an atomic interferometer which will measure the phase in this experiment. And the interferometer we beat is shown here. So in the center, you have the high Q cavity, which stores the photon. The atoms are crossing the cavity one by one, and they are finally detected downstream in state E or G. Two very important ingredients here are these auxiliary cavities, R1 and R2. In R1, we prepare by a pulse of microwave the state superposition. So this is equivalent to starting a stopwatch. We prepare the atomic dipole in one direction. Then it starts processing. And when it leaves the cavity, we apply a second flash of microwave, which will analyze the phase of this uh, uh, of, of the atomic dipole. In the case when you have a high phase shift per photon, it means that if there is zero photon, the dipole will point in one direction. And the second pulse will map this back into level E. And if it points in the opposite direction, the second pulse will map it into level G. So finally, when you will detect the atom in E or in G, it will mean that there are one or zero photons in the case. And this 
this system with two auxiliary cavities, which applies separated oscillatory fields to the atom, is known as the Ramsey interferometer. And in fact, this interferometer was invented by Norman Ramsey in the 1940s, at the end of the 1940s, and it is a standard apparatus which is used in all standard atomic clocks, cesium clocks. So, but we are indeed here is a ring clock, and I just want to mention that Norman Ramsey was a Dave Wine and PG advisor. So you see that both our advisors are important in this story, and that our two stories are, as we say in quantum physics, entangled in this way. In this way. So we use this setup, and you see here the kind of uh, signals that we get. A red bar means an atom detected in level E, a blue bar, an atom detected in level G. And you see that if the cavities have a very low temperature, so that there can be only zero or one photon in it, according to the black body uh, Planck's law, uh, you see that when the pho a photon pops in the cavity or disappears, you see clearly the quantum jumps of the field. The field jumps suddenly from one state to the other, and you see this jump, and you can see this jump in real time. It is the first time that quantum jumps have been observed with the field. Uh, Dave will describe to you in a short while the experiment he is doing on ions, and they observed for the first time quantum jumps in single ions about 20 years before we did that experiment on the field. And to come back to Schrodinger, Schrodinger was very dubious about the possibility of observing the quantum jumps. In fact, the papers that I, the quotation that I made at the beginning about the ichthyosaurus and so on, and, and, and the post-mortem physics, is taken from a paper whose title was Are they quantum jumps? Question mark. And you see that now that we can manipulate the system and observe them, we observe the quantum jumps directly. We did that also for fields. Also, you can see that hundreds of atoms see the same photon, which means that it's really quantum and destructive. You can also do the same experiment with larger photon numbers. You see, what we start is by doing, we inject a coherent field in the cavity. We have a microwave source of radiation which inject a field, but we don't know the field can contain between 0 and 7 photon. In fact, it is in a superposition state of 0, 1, 2, up to 7 photon. And since we don't know anything about the field, we have to assume a flat distribution, no knowledge. And then we send atoms one by one, and by measuring the phase of the dipole for each atom, we get partial information, and we build up the information as the atom cross the cavity. And after a few tens of atoms have crossed the cavity, uh, we, we, by updating the knowledge that we have about the system, we obtain a single result. And you will see what happens. This is a real experiment. You will see what happens as atoms cross the cavity one by one. You see, these two photon numbers are the ones which will finally emerge. This is four photons, and the blue one is five photons. And you see that in this realization, finally, the system converges towards five photons. And this kind of experiment shows you directly the collapse of the wave function. As you measure and gain information in the system, a wave function, which is in a superposition of states, converges to an eigenstate of the measuring uh, observable, which is here the photon number. If you keep measuring over a longer period of time, what you see is this kind of uh, staircase evolution. Of course, the photon disappeared due to the photon losses on a time scale of the order of 0.1 second. And you see this kind of staircases, uh, which reveal the quantum jumps of a field containing many photons. And uh, classically, we are not used to this kind of curve. Classically, you would say that the field should decay exponentially. 